grateful. that you woke me up this morning. Grateful that I had strength in my limbs to just roll over, sit on the side of the bed. Grateful that when I hung my legs over to the side, I still had strength in my limbs. I'm grateful that when I stood up, I could walk. When I stood up, I could see. Grateful that I could feel with my hands. I'm grateful. If God has done anything for you today. If you're grateful for anything that he's done for you today, why don't you give him a hand clap of praise? No matter where you are, no matter who you're sitting next to, give God a hand clap of praise. If you're grateful this morning for what he's done for you, Every now and then, it's okay to praise him. Every now and then, it's, it's okay to just forget yourself <laughs> and thank him. Just praise him. know he's good. Yes, sir. All the time and all the time. He's good. Let's give him another yes, hand clap of praise. Well, it's that time now. I would, my brothers and sisters, that you would turn with me now to our scriptural reference for this morning's sermon, and it's found in the book of Hebrews, and while we're looking for that, I'm going to give you an opportunity to turn off all your little tweety phones and your chirping phones. If you don't know how to put it on vibrate, just shut it off altogether. I promise you, I promise you, whoever's looking for you, if they love you, they'll be looking for you after service. Amen. Amen. Chirp, chirp. Just turn them off. I think for 13 years I, I told you unless you were a doctor on 24-hour call, amen, just turn them off. Isn't it good to just dedicate some of your time to God? Yes, sir. And not be interrupted by man. Amen. Amen. Our scriptural text is coming from the book of Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verses 4 through 11. And we're going to be reading from the Message Bible this morning, a more contemporary rendering of this text, the Message Bible. We have it prepared for you on our television monitors, and I would that you read that with me at this time. Let's read it together. In this all-out match against sin... Others have suffered far worse than you to say nothing of what Jesus went through, all that bloodshed. So don't feel sorry for yourselves. I have you forgotten how good parents treat children and that God regards you as his children. My dear child, don't shrug off God's discipline. 
but don't be crushed by it either. It's the child he loves that he disciplines, the child he embraces, he also corrects. God is educating you. That's why you must never drop out. He's treating you as dear children. This trouble you're in isn't punishment, it's training, the normal experience of children. Only irresponsible parents leave children to fend for themselves. Would you prefer an irresponsible God? We respect our own parents for training and not spoiling us, so why not embrace God's training so we can truly live? While we were children, our parents did what seemed best to them, but God is doing what is best for us training us to live God's holy best. At the time, discipline isn't much fun. It always feels like it's going against the grain. Later, of course, it pays off handsomely, for it's the well-trained who finds themselves mature in the relationship with God. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. At the time, discipline isn't much fun. It always feels like it's going against the grain. Do I have a witness? Yes, sir. But later, of course, it pays off handsomely. Yes, sir. Right. For it's the well-trained who find themselves mature in their relationship with God. From this text, I, I want to speak for just a few moments on the subject of God's love misunderstood. Well, well, well. God's love misunderstood. Thank you, With my underlying premise, well, well. my central theme, my main point, being this, if you don't get anything else out of today's sermon, before you check out on me and go to sleep, get this. Yeah, man, get this. Saying sometimes we misunderstand God's love as punishment rather than correction. Punishment has a negative connotation <coughs> and is viewed as God's response to our negative behavior. However, correction has a positive connotation and is viewed as God's teaching us something that will better us as individuals. Just as any loving parent, God corrects us and then teaches us for our own good. Yes, sir. Do I have a witness? Amen. My brothers and sisters, God loves you. God loves you. I'm going to let that marinate in your spirit for just a minute this morning. God loves you. Amen. Thank you, Lord. I, I, I know, I know, I know. For some of us, that statement is hard to believe. Why? Because we don't feel loved. Well. Instead, when we look at our current status in life, we feel just the opposite. We feel as if we're being punished for something we've done in the past. We don't understand God's love or his methodology of expressing his love. 
And if truth be told, many of us have never really understood what real love felt like anyway. You know, I've, I've heard many say, Rev, I, I never heard my father say he loved me. Uh, I know that my mother must have loved me because of what she did for me, but after I reached an early age, I don't recall my mother ever telling me that she loved me. I don't, I don't recall that. I, I, can't, I can't remember my father ever saying he loved me, and I can't remember my, my mother ever telling me that she loved me. As your pastor, I, I know how they feel because I too had no recollection of my parents telling me that they loved me. My mother was absent and my father was a hard and critical man. And I never heard him say he loved me. But later, when I was 33 years of age, I confronted him. I, I was a man then. I confronted him and I told him, I said, Dad, I've never heard, 33 years, I've never heard you say to me, son, I love you. And he reproved me and rebuked me <laughs> by saying that he showed me that he loved me by what he did for me during my youth. Therefore, he didn't have to say it. He didn't have to use those words. He said, I could have been like many other men. I, I could have left you. <laughs> but I stayed here with you. I raised you and all of your siblings. Yes, sir. So I ain't have to say it. I, I showed you that I loved you. So I know and have experienced firsthand that void that loneliness in spirit that can develop as a person growing up, aching to hear the unspoken words of approval, the unspoken words of affection, the unspoken words of love. And I even carried that void years later into my ministry. For I didn't feel the love of God in my heart. I knew he loved me off the basis of his word, but I did not have a feeling that he loved me. I served God uh, out of a feeling of obligation and fear. Some of you may have been that way. I had a fear that this long, white, bearded, heavenly being was hovering over me, judging everything that I did and everything that I said. And if I didn't do it right, or if I didn't say it right, then he would punish me in some way. Or he would refrain from sharing his love with me. Do I have a witness? And it was long after many years of ministry that I had an experience or an epiphany and finally realized that emotionalism has never been a barometer of faith. Yes, sir. And that by faith, Say I had to believe and accept the truth that God really did love me. Yes, sir. It was then and only then that I truly felt the love of God filling my heart. And I can truly say, saints, that there's nothing better than knowing that God loves you. And he loves you with an infinite, yes. unconditional love. And that it's out of his love that he has created you. It's out of his love that he has forgiven you. It's out of his love that he receives you fully as his beloved child. Amen. And to that I say, hallelujah. As I experience this epiphany, you know they say that God always has a ram in the bush. 
And while I had this void and never felt, I never, heard, never felt the love and never heard the words, I love you, from my father or my mother, God always has a way. And there was this one person that has been with me every day of my life for 65 years. couldn't hear it from my father when I didn't realize it when I was down she was there when I made mistakes she was there never condemning but always uplifting yes when I was lost and didn't know which way to turn she was there. When I got in trouble, was afraid to call home and tell my father that I was somewhere that I shouldn't be. You know where you hear the gate slam behind you, clank. No lie. <laughs> I called her. And after I got to reminiscing about everything that this woman did for me. For 65 years of my life, she's been the example, the unconditional, non-judgmental, loving example of what God is really like. And she's with me this morning. That's my sister. That's my sister, Pat. So, Pat, this wasn't in the sermon, but I need you to know that I love you for loving me. Amen. For 65 Amen. years, she has demonstrated the love of God. Amen. Why do you feel important? Why did you feel it important, Reverend, to bring up and point out your sister? It's because of what I tell you every Sunday. My brothers and sisters, sometimes people don't have people in their lives that can say, I love you. That's right, Reverend. Sometimes people don't have other family members in their lives that can reach out to them and comfort them and support them when they're down. So we, as brothers and sisters in Christ, when we see somebody that's down, when we see somebody that's hurting, when we see somebody that's in need, that's the time for us as brothers and sisters in Christ to reach out and let somebody know, baby, it's going to be okay. Amen. Amen. Because Amen. God loves you. And so do I. The saints, God's love is not influenced by circumstances or situations. And God's love can't be diminished. God can never love you more than he loves you today. And neither can he love you any less. He loves you solely on the basis that he created you and he chooses to love you now and every moment of your life. Yes, sir. Nothing that you do or nothing that happens to you can separate you from the love of God. For Paul says in Romans 8, 35, and then 37 through 39, Paul says, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Yes, sir. Amen. Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword but in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him yes, who loved us. Yes, sir. For I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God. Yes, sir. 
which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Isn't that good news? Yes, sir. Thank you, Lord. Nothing. Nothing you've done. Yes, sir. Nothing that anybody else has done to you. Nothing that anybody else has said to you can separate you from the love of God. Beloved, God did not wait for us to come to him with an expression of love before he extended his love to us. No, no. To the contrary, God loved us first. John says it rather eloquently in 1 John 4 and 19 where he says, we love him because he first loved us. Yes, sir. And then the truth of the matter is this, saints. God is always waiting with open arms, ready to receive those who turn to him. He longs to embrace us, forgive us, restore us to full fellowship with him, and he longs to bless us as his children. Now, I know. I know. I know what some of you are thinking right now. Mm -hmm. I can look at your faces. I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, Rev, if all that's true, that God loves me and that he longs to embrace us and forgive us and restore us and bless us, then why doesn't it feel that way? Why do I feel as if God doesn't care about me or love me? And I humbly submit to you that you feel this way because you misunderstand God's love. I concur with Dr. Chan, uh, Charles Stanley wherein he writes in his book entitled Sharing the Gift of Encouragement that people don't typically feel the love of God because of three things. And here they are. The first thing is they've never had a role model of God's love. They don't understand God's love because they've never had a role model to effectively show them God's love. The second thing is They've been taught incorrectly about God's love. And the third thing is they've gone through difficulties that they believe a loving God could, would, or should have spared them from experiencing. Yes. Amen. Amen. Didn't have an effective role model. They've been taught incorrectly about God's love. And then they've gone through difficulties that they felt a loving God should have prevented them from going through. Well, let's deal with those three things and I'm going to take my seat. The first thing, our lack of understanding about God's love comes largely from a lack of effective role models. Church, it isn't enough to have someone tell you that he or she loves you. That person must be there for you when you need him or her. We each need to experience love in tangible and physical forms. I'm hungry. I need to be fed. Don't just tell me you love me and then walk away from me. Amen. Do I have a witness? Amen. We need the presence, the comfort, and touch of other people. We especially need this when we're experiencing pain, suffering, depression, rejection, loneliness, tragedies, crisis, sickness, and hard times. We need love that has arms. Yes, sir. That will hold us, hug us, comfort us, and say, God loves you. And so do I. My brothers and sisters, I've learned through ministry that sometimes, as I shared this with you last week, 
And the danger, yeah, I'm watching you. I'm, I'm looking at all three of you. The danger is that we sometimes use careless words. And there's a danger in using careless words. Amen? Yes. Amen. So sometimes the best ministry is the ministry of silence. Uh -huh. So sometimes when we go into a hospital room, and the family's together, and they've received difficult news. They don't need to hear platitudes. They, they don't need to hear your speculative advice. All they need is your presence. And sometimes just holding somebody's hand, sometimes just putting your arm around someone and giving them a hug, not, not even saying a word, but just being there for them, sharing that hug is ministry enough to get that person through. Yes, sir. One of the central teachings of the early church was that Christians were to be role models of God's love one to another. John wrote in 1 John 4.11, If God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Amen. Saints, we must demonstrate the love of Christ by being effective role models. We must be the arms that hug, that hold, that comfort others that are hurting. We must be the mouths that say God loves you and so do I. Second thing, our lack of understanding about God's love comes largely because of incorrect teaching. And that's where I was. We must dispel the incorrect teaching regarding God and his love. God is not, let me repeat my brothers and sisters, God is not a harsh judge with a long white beard sitting on his throne just waiting to pounce on you for doing something wrong. The Bible teaches us that God's very nature, his essence, his personality is love. John 3.16 teaches us that the motivation for God sending his only son, Jesus, into the world was love. For it says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God's desire is to reveal himself to us as a loving father. One who will protect us, one who will provide for us, yes. one who will forgive us, one who will help us, one who will bless us, one who will encourage us, one who will uplift us. Amen. Yes, sir. God wants to shower his love upon us and give good gifts to us. Yes, sir. He wants to be in a loving relationship with us so that we can share our hearts fully with him and he in turn can share himself fully with us. As disciples of Jesus Christ, we must dispel the incorrect teaching regarding God and his love and demonstrate the truth by our actions and our lifestyles. I praise yes, God now that I've gotten over that incorrect teaching about God. Yes, sir. I Amen. praise God. I don't know if you're like me, but sometimes I'm afraid to even tell my best friend something I've done wrong. Marvin and I have been together since the first grade. But I wouldn't dare tell Marvin all the devilment. <laughs> you know, because loose lips <laughs> sink ships. So I wouldn't dare tell him all the devilment that I've been in. But praise God, I've got somebody that I can go to and I don't have to worry about holding nothing back. I can share my innermost secrets. I can tell him how I feel, and as I tell him how I feel and confess my sins unto him and ask him to forgive me of my sins and help me turn all the way around so that I can repent of my sins, I can feel his loving arms engulf me. We have a lack of understanding, and it comes because of incorrect teaching. Our third and yes. final point, our lack of understanding about God's love comes largely because of our misunderstanding of how God can use difficulties to purify and perfect us. Yes, sir. 
Do you not know, my brothers and sisters, that people falsely believe God to be the source or instigator of our trouble? They end up blaming God for every tragedy, for every disappointment or crisis that comes their way. They ask, how could God love me and allow this terrible thing to happen to me? Am I coming down your street? In Matthew 5.45, we're taught that good and bad times happen to believers and unbelievers alike. That's right. Do I have a witness? No person is immune. No person is immune from life circumstances, both positive and negative. We live in a fallen world in what, which both evil and good exist. So I wish I had two or three people that heard what I was saying. And at no time are we told that God spares Christians from all temptations or all trials or all problems. What we are taught however, is that God is with us yes, sir. and remains with us when trouble strikes yes, and that God can use the trials or difficulties to accomplish a good purpose in our lives. That's why Paul says in Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. I remember, I remember, I remember the day that I was out of town. I was in Cincinnati visiting Lynn. And we were at the Jazz Festival. I was all set to hear Charlie Wilson. <laughs> yes, I remember. <laughs> I was all set to hear the whispers. <laughs> and as Lynn and I were sitting there, my phone rang. And I answered the phone. And it was my baby boy. It was Jamil. And he told me, he said, Daddy, I'm in the hospital with Torrin. And they're saying he's not going to make it. You need to get home immediately. He might not make it through the night. So I left Leanne at the concert. I jumped in my car. And all the way driving home, I was praying. Lord, spare my son. If you do anything at all for me, keep my son alive till I get there. And I was so burdened down with pain and with grief that the adversary started working on me. And I thought about every sin I had committed, every mistake that I had made, every devilish thing that I had done, and, and started blaming myself and saying, it's because of everything I've done that my son is being punished. I told you, just like when I mentioned my sister Pat, God having a ram in the bush. I was so distraught, so depressed, that I just pushed his number in. And I called my friend, Pastor Cochran. And I told Pastor Cochran, Doc, this is what I'm dealing with. I, I got tears falling down my face. My son is dying. Could it be? You know, the Bible says that the children suffer because of the sins of their father. I was distraught. And then Pastor methodically taught me the correctness of that scripture. He taught me about God's love. What are you saying, preacher? I've preached a thousand times. I've shared it with you a thousand times. But when you're in the fire, yeah, yeah, when yeah. you're in the crucible, yeah, sir. when your family's hurting, yeah. when your child is dying, yeah, yeah. 
and Satan jumps on you with both feet, that's when you need another man or woman of God that you can reach out to and they can share with you the truths of the Spirit, yes. wrap their arms around you and tell you, Son, I love you and God is still with you and he's still yes, sir. Yes, sir. in control because of him counseling me and praying with me and witnessing to me all the way down that highway. I got back to that hospital at midnight, prayed over my son, and he lived a year beyond that day. Amen. Saints, God's purpose in allowing difficulty into our lives is so that he might either correct us from error or further refine in us those things that are good. We are constantly in a state of being purified, which means whereas all impurities of sin are being burned away from us, and we're constantly in a state of being perfected, which means all good things in us are being strengthened by God. In our text, we are assured that those whom the Lord loves, he chastens. When we're being chastened, God is calling us to turn away from the things that are evil or harmful. He doesn't want us to suffer the terrible consequences of sin. God's process is not one of punishment. Let me make that perfectly clear. It's not one of punishment, which is the response to negative behavior, but it's out of correction, which has a teaching component to it. God's intent is that we learn a positive lesson so that we might change our ways, so that we might grow spiritually and put ourselves into a position to receive an even greater blessing from our loving Heavenly Father. Amen. Just as any loving parent, God corrects us and teaches us for our good. Let me hear we on. The process, the perfecting process, is one of ongoing learning in times of difficulty. The Lord brings to strength those character traits in us that are godly. It is in times of trouble when we learn in a focused way how to apply God's wisdom, his love, and power. In many ways, the traits of self-control, endurance in faith, and true godliness are forged in the fires of suffering. 2 Peter 1, 5 through 8. The purpose of God in perfecting us is that we might be more useful servants in God's kingdom. Our witness might be brighter, our service yes, more productive and effective. God loves us enough to want us to grow up in the very likeness of Jesus Christ, his beloved son. So when you're going through something, it's not God that puts you in it. God may have allowed you to go through it, but God is walking with you as you're in it. Yes, sir. And God is strengthening you. He's prepping you. He's yes, preparing you to handle the next tribulation that comes along. Yes, sir, Reverend. He's not punishing you, but he's perfecting you. Yes, sir. In 2 Corinthians 1, verse 4, Paul says, God doesn't comfort us in our sorrow to make us feel comfortable. Hallelujah. But that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the same comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying when you go through a difficult time, when you go through trials or tribulation, when you go through challenges and God rescues you through those challenges, yes, he sir. lifts you up out of the muck and mire and he delivers you. He didn't do that just for you. Yes, sir. Right. <laughs> But he did that so that when you encounter somebody else, when you encounter another brother or sister in Christ and they're going through it, that's when you can really testify. Yes, sir. And say, I've been where you've been. And God met me at my point of need. And God delivered me. And the same God that delivered me. Yes, sir. He'll deliver you. <laughs> He'll deliver you. Do I have Thank a witness? Amen. A.B. Yeah, Simpson says, there are two ways of getting out of a trial. One is simply to try to get rid of the trial. 
and be thankful when it's over. The other is to recognize the trial as a challenge from God to claim a larger blessing than we've ever had and to hail it with delight as an opportunity of obtaining a larger measure of divine grace. Let me close by leaving this poem with you. Life's not a cloudless journey. Storms and darkness often oppress. But the Father, the Father's changeless mercy comes to cheer the heart's distress. Heavy clouds may darkly hover, hiding our face view above, but across the thickest darkness shines the rainbow of his love. For every hill I've had to climb, for every stone that bruised my feet, for all the blood and sweat and grind, forbidding storms and burning heat, my heart sings but a grateful song, these were the things that made me strong. For all the heartaches and the tears, for all the anguish and the pain, for gloomy days and fruitless years, and for the hopes that lived in vain, I do give thanks for now I know these were the things that helped me grow. Yes. Tis not the softer things of life which stimulate man's will to strive but bleak adversity and strife do most to keep the man's will alive. O'er roll-strewn path the weaklings creep, but brave hearts dare to climb the steep. So saints, I close this sermon by admonishing you to remember this. In this all-out match against sin, others have suffered far worse than you to say nothing of what Jesus went through all that bloodshed just do this when you're going through something when, when you really feel downtrodden when you really feel stressed when, when you really feel as if you can't go on just focus on Jesus. Focus on his passion. Focus on the beating. Focus on them putting a crown of thorns on his head. Yes, sir. Focus on the ridicule. Focus on him being spat upon. Focus on him being cursed at. Focus on him being stabbed in his side. Focus on the nail prints in his hand. Focus on the nail prints in his feet. Yes, sir. So don't feel sorry for yourselves. Or have you forgotten how good parents treat children and that God regards you as his children? My dear child, don't shrug off God's discipline, but don't be crushed by it either. It's the child he loves that he disciplines. The child he embraces, he also corrects. Yes, sir. God is simply educating you. That's why you must never drop out. He's treating you as dear children. The trouble you're in isn't punishment. It's training. Yes. And training is the normal experience of children. So don't my brothers and sisters, misunderstand God's love.